that we start Shabbat by Tzedek Kuchavim, not by the Shkia, eh, okay, the custom is not this way, but Satmar still, still holds this way. And it's hard to argue because this, there was a time where at least that was like the basic command of, of the halacha. So, Whoa. we had a question once in the, <laughs> right, mind blown. <laughs> so we had a question once like this in the, in the Yeshiva where there was a guy who's, uh, his wife was from uh, Haifa and they were dry, whatever, it was late. And they had to take a cab uh, to get from Itzperichol to Haifa with a bus. It was like a three-day thing. So they finally get there, and he's pushing it with Shabbat. He knows he's not going to get to his mother-in-law's house on time. If they walk, they have to take a cab. And he was saying, as far as Yichol Shabbat are concerned, can I take a cab? If I know that the cab driver doesn't live in that neighborhood, maybe he's going to have to drive back. So he's the ins and the outs and the ups and the downs. And in the end, I remember the... Uh, uh, who said, look, you do what you need to do. If he decides he wants to keep Shabbat and not keep Shabbat, it's not really technically your problem. He said, and then maybe he holds like a Rebbe Tam and the Satma Rebbe. He just starts Shabbat later than you do. It's also a, a, a possibility. But uh, so, so you'll tell me, no, it's Shabbat, and I should be yelling, kicking, and screaming, and insulting my wife, and, and terrorizing my kids. Because in another 18 minutes, the sun's going to go down, which is according to one opinion, the beginning of Shabbat, and over another opinion, have another 72 minutes after that. So we like to be from, we like to be strict, we like to take you know, a little bit of a precaution. It's good, it's, it's nice when you're at that level of understanding. Right? If someone were to come to my house carrying a bottle of wine or smoking a cigarette, you know, in this uh, twilight, literally it's the English word twilight, uh, so I wouldn't say anything. It's just not worth it, you know? If someone's still smoking that close to it's okay, so maybe after the cigarette is done, you'll start holding the Rabbein Otam, and then in the future you'll start holding like the, the Gionim, and uh, a little bit more, more normatively. But, but the point that I'd like to make is this. The, the solution to a situation, to a problem of assimilation, is really assimilation in the other direction. In other words, we need to get used to making incremental changes in our lives. One of the reasons people don't change is because they have an inhibition. Something, a psychological block preventing them from changing. Why would you prevent yourself from changing? I'm going to go like from this to Meshaharim tomorrow. That's crazy. That's insanity, right? As if taking upon yourself one more mitzvah all of a sudden makes you a Horidiyah, a Shiite, you know, that you're going to start blowing up buses. You can't be a little bit more careful about one or two things. Avakashon hara, maybe gezer, some of the stuff that the Gemara itself tells you, just about everybody's guilty of. We're people, and we're not always careful about everything. Assimilation isn't a bad thing. It just depends on what direction you're going. To assimilate people gradually and slowly into a life of Torah mitzvot is tremendous. This is the goal. This is the ultimate item. Just a shetiyah kadat in onis. Don't force people into it. It never lasts. It never leaves a good taste in anybody's mouth. No one ever comes back asking for more when they feel like they were forced or coerced into something. And if I thought I knew people like this when I was younger, that were really receptive to Musar, to being told you're an idiot, you're an imbecile, you don't know anything, yeah, some people like it, that it's fiery, that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's scorching hot, and it's like eating a red hot pepper. At the end of the day, most of them aren't observant anymore. It was cute during a certain phase in their lives, and they kind of moved on and found things that were more, more comfortable for them. What you're comfortable with will change over time. And that change is incremental. What you're able to achieve is unlimited, but you have to take those first steps in order to get there. So no one goes from 0 to 100 in a second in either direction. Very, very few people manage to make a very revolutionary change in their lives over a short period of time. And you, you, you know all of them, because the few people who did are in the Gemara. Rabbi Akiva overnight decided, I'm illiterate, I'm going to learn, I'm going to be the greatest rabbi in the generation, and he did it. He didn't do it overnight. He started in the, in the Kita'ana and, and mixed his wife with the whole donkey thing. <laughs> I know right. that story. Right. Yeah, and he started in Kita'ana and then... So and even with him, it was incremental. Yeah. Right. It, it, was, it was incremental. It was already 40. It was so 40, yeah. It, it was a relatively short period of time over which he learned you know, the basics yeah. and then he became very proficient. Yeah. Then he was already teaching by the end of the 14 years. But So even this... You don't have too many people that go radical extremes, you know, one end to the other, in either direction. People generally don't like to make radical changes. And radical changes... Well, you have the Yiddish Shaman that we on the other side. Right. 
who was religious, and then uh, although, although I mean, you said he, you said the, his father was kind of borderline. His parents weren't so observant to begin with, oh, uh, but if you follow his story, it looks like he was also going from one step to the next. Look, the story is told after uh, Rabbi Meir catches up with him when he's on a horse, he's you know, walking out of the Tchum on Shabbat, and Rabbi Meir says to him, Lankan Tchum Shabbat. Basically, he's telling him, you know, like, you, you've, you've blitzed through all of the roadblocks. You've just knocked down every barrier. Like, wh where does it stop? When can ultimately get you to come back? And then when he tells him that he's not sure that he can, uh, that he can still do Teshuvah, uh, there's a whole discussion back and forth as to whether or not someone who's done that much evil over such a period of time can still do Teshuvah or not. So it's not like he went, you know, totally black overnight. What about the one who went up? There are like several rabbis who went up to Ganeven. Oh, it's him? Yeah, the one. What are they saying? Yeah. The one they're talking about. Was it Rabbi Wong? It is sharp in the wheel. So he, he became a heretic. Apparently the switch was made relatively uh, quickly. But it seems like there were still certain things. He was still quoting Sukim. I mean, like, he still knew things. Well, he had the knowledge, but he right. was not practicing. So, but eventually he, he, came, uh, he came undone. Uh, there are a few extreme examples in the Gemara of someone who made a very quick and radical change. Usually they died not long thereafter. That's the truth. Like, you have this, the Roman soldier that was uh, executing Rabbi uh, Haram yeah. uh, who basically jumps into this fire and you know, kills himself. And, and we're told that he's invited to uh, Olam Abba. Uh, you have, you know, exceptional extreme acts of, of uh, zeal or of, of, you know, bravery and courage, but they're very rare. That's not a lifestyle. It's not how you, you don't build a society this way. So if one individual made an exceptional effort to do something special, that's on, on a one-time basis. And by the way, this is true also when it comes to fundraising and other things, getting somebody to make a one-time effort is a lot easier than getting someone to make incremental changes in their life. That's difficult. The incremental change this way, which the incremental change that way, requires constant cooking, right? And to get someone to do something on a one-time basis, sure. Lots of people fast for young people. Have you put on tefillin every day? Well, I mean, it's much easier to get a lot of small donations than it is to get one big one. Also true. <laughs> also true. Mm -hmm. the, the idea is that, uh, you know, it depends. If you find somebody who's very, uh, has like... Uh, yeah. Pangs of conscience, you know, really should wake up early in the morning for Tefillah. Well, we've been hoping for that for a few years, right. and it's never. Hopefully, it's uh, it's building up. But uh, but but this is a very uh, you know, it's a fascinating, interesting detail in the uh, in the midrash itself, where this whole concept of the drinks being, you know, according to everybody, what they're comfortable with and what they're into, you see that they drink more and more over the time. You know, that the story unfolds. In other words, like the goal of there being no ones was basically to force you gently into doing something more than you intended to, more than you planned, and ultimately getting you to assimilate into larger culture where you're just easier to control. And Yitzhak Hara loves that kind of stuff. He gobbles it up. So that's maybe, so, he said, so the whole thing is in on this. I mean, like, no force, could they say it like about ten times? And yeah, times. no, there's no force, which so means what? Know, yeah. If you want to eat first and then drink, if you want to drink first and then eat, if you drink out of small cups, drink out of big cups, yeah. if you don't like to drink wine that was in uh, wood, you drink out of... Uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, porcelain, not porcelain, uh, earthenware. You don't want to drink out of earthenware, you drink out of porcelain. Yeah. The, the goal was that you should drink. And somehow you were going to drink. And how does it get you to drink? They almost force you to drink by not forcing you to do anything. Yeah. Yeah, that's, the, uh, that's the concept. So when it comes to Torah, it's, well, it's the same thing. The same concepts apply. Go slowly, grow incrementally, do it, make sure that you enjoy it, whatever it is that you do. And slowly but surely, you can leave certain things. I mean, it's, uh, it's inevitable. Someone who's doing Tishwima is going to continue doing certain Averot. They'll hopefully tone down over time. But you have to be tolerant of that if you want to see uh, an eventual change, if you want to see something uh, grow and move. So at the end of the Megillah, Esther manages to make a very revolutionary you know, request. She's ready to, even if he kills her, because she approached the king without his permission, the time came for something drastic. You know? But even this, she slowly and incrementally built it up. Mm -hmm. Uh, and by the way, she never forced him to drink. Mm -hmm. She just invited him politely to a party that she's throwing for him, and Haman comes too, so the first time, the second time. At this point, Haman is so into it that he suspects that she likes him. Uh, and that's, uh, right? Haman believe He says, who does she like? Who did she invite except for me and the king? And even today, she invited me to come to her, so she was really him. And that's how uh, she got him to, uh, to expose himself to the point that he was ultimately... Uh, wiped out. And Amalek represents this uh, psychopathic uh, drive towards extreme changes overnight. 
all or nothing. If I don't have everything, nothing is worth it. If I didn't do everything perfectly, it's I'm going to tear it all down and, and start again. And Haman is ultimately cut out. He's ultimately, that's, that's we can't tolerate this uh, insane, obsessive, compulsive mm-hmm. perfectionism. It's not something we have uh, much room for in, uh, in spirituality. So, if you have something to uh, digest, we'll talk.